and thank you for tuning in to Weather Watch, Millersville University's exclusive weather news program. I'm your host, Carissa Lincoln. Last episode, Weather Watch's top five specialist, Kelly Livingston, revealed our countdown of the top five floods in the United States. We find out now what takes our number four spot. Welcome back to the Weather Watch Top 5. Our next flood brought 14 inches of rain coupled with melting snow from the nearby mountains that unleashed onto New England, making it the greatest flood in its history to that date. Coming in at number 4 is the Great Flood of 1936. The winter between 1935 and 1936 were severe with lower than normal temperatures, keeping snow packed intact until the beginning of March from the 11th to the 13th. This is when rising temperatures and heavy rainfall brought severe flooding to New England. A few days later, after the initial flooding, a second system moved into New England, dumping even more rain in the area. The Pinkham Knot Station on Mount Washington, which had received over 7 inches of rain during the previous storm, received over 10 inches on March 18th and 19th. Almost all the snowpack in New England, except that in northern Maine and New Hampshire contributed major runoff to the rivers. The excessive flooding caused severe damage. The entire reach of the Connecticut River was severely impacted. The Merrimack River Basin also saw substantial damage. Unfortunately, a less severe storm arrived a few days later. However, this final event served only to lengthen the duration of the flooding rather than cause any new significant flood peaks. During the two-week period, the majority of New England was affected by a combination of rainfall and snowmelt totaling over 10 inches. In fact, a peak estimate of nearly 30 inches was observed. Water and ice flows tore out bridges, highways, roads, and railways. The dam at New Hartford burst and homes and buildings were washed away or destroyed. The waters at Hartford rose to a level of 8.6 feet higher than any previous flood level on record, flooding most of the downtown commercial area. 14,000 people were left homeless, 150 were dead or missing, and an epidemic disease threatened the population. The National Guard was called to action as the ravaging floods paralyzed business, traffic, communication, and home life. The cities and towns along the rivers became the principal centers of destruction. While the loss of life was small, damages exceeded over $100 million, making it the costliest New England weather event during that time. Reporting for Weather Watch, I'm student meteorologist Kelly Livingston. Thanks, Kelly. During the meteorological winter, an unpredictable phenomenon occurs where significantly cold air moves across a body of warmer water, creating snow squalls. To the general public, this is better known as lake effect snow. Weather Watch's Mike Yolch goes into greater detail in exactly how and why this event occurs. Every winter, certain parts of the country have to deal with the white stuff. Snow. Parts of the East Coast can receive their snowfall through two common systems. Clippers and the classic nor'easter. However, there are a few select regions called snow belts that can receive tremendous amounts of snowfall through another method called lake effect snow. A snow belt is an area that is associated with the southern and eastern shores of the Great Lakes that receive colossal amounts of snow. The reason is through a phenomenon known as lake effect snow. Two ingredients that produce this type of snow are cold air and warm water. As cold air moves over the relatively warm waters of the lakes, instability begins to occur in the atmosphere. With this instability, evaporation begins. As the wind pushes the air mass to shore, vertical motion of the air builds clouds. Within time, snow begins to fall from these newly formed clouds. These lake effect snow bands that form are usually 20 miles wide but can range to hundreds of miles inland. The intensity and snowfall accumulation is determined by how warm the water is and how long the cold air is over the lake. The temperature difference between the cold air and warm water must be at least 23 degrees Fahrenheit. Wind also plays an impact on the formation of lake effect snow by determining the location of the snow bands. During lake effect snow events, it is not uncommon for blizzard conditions 
which include heavy winds and drifting snow, and sometimes accumulations from one to three inches per hour. Areas in the snow belt are reminded each winter how intense these mesoscale systems can be. Some of the greatest snowfall accumulations in history are as followed. December 24th through the 28th in Buffalo, New York, with 82.3 inches in 2001. January 28, 2004 through January 31st in Oswego County, New York with a range of 48 to 72 inches. And in 1996, November 9th through the 14th in Cleveland, Ohio with 70 inches. An area in New York called the Tug Hill Plateau is famous for its large snowfall accumulations with a seasonal average of 115 inches per year. Deep within the Tug is a town called Redfield which averages 300 inches of snow seasonally. In the winter months, this region is home to hundreds of miles of trails for snowmobiling. Reporting for WeatherWatch, I'm student meteorologist Mike Yalch. Very interesting, Mike. In conjunction with Lake Effect Snow, a select group of Millersville meteorology students spent their winter near the Finger Lakes in Geneva, New York. They conducted research to better understand all of the components that go into producing lake effect systems. Fortunately, one of WeatherWatch's own had a first-hand experience during the Ontario Winter Lake Effect Systems Research Project. Lake effect snow is often unpredictable and contains a lot of uncertainty when forecasting, even with today's meteorological advances. That's why researchers and students from all over the country came together during the 2013-2014 winter season for the Ontario Winter Lake Effect Systems, or OWLS Research Project. The OWLS Research Project was funded by the National Science Foundation and lasted two months in upstate New York using a new method of research to gather data about how we can better predict lake effect snow. The overarching goal is to study lake effect snow. There are two sub-goals. There's one group of researchers that are interested in snowstorms, lake effect snowstorms, off of Lake Ontario primarily, that happen when the winds, when the winds blow more or less from the west to the east. And then another group of researchers that are interested in lake effect snowstorms that happen when the winds blow kind of from the north to the south. Our focus was on the downwind persistence of lake effect snow bands. We were looking at that mechanism where you have air moving across the lake. It's convectively unstable because you have a buoyancy source represented by Lake Ontario. And as that air moves further downstream and away from the lake, how is it that one can get snow bands persisting all the way down into northern Pennsylvania and central Pennsylvania while that buoyancy source is removed. So we're looking at those kinds of things. Even though they're not that big, they can be intense and they can affect commerce. So for example, you might have some of these bands uh, advecting across an interstate highway. The traffic's flowing smoothly. It's nice conditions. The street, the, the street is dry. You go over a hill and all of a sudden it's snow covered and there can be traffic accidents because of that. Instruments used during the project range from aircrafts flying into lake effect systems to the Doppler on wheels sampling the bands while they traveled over land. The Wyoming King Air is a meteorological aircraft that houses a number of weather instruments that can fly inside the lake effect bands, where researchers do not have to rely on remote sensing alone. This is the first time meteorologists have been able to collect data from inside the band. Peering vertically down, band structure and characteristics can be determined by the King Air. From the ground, the Doppler on wheels and mobile mesonets, often known for chasing tornadoes, were also used during the project. The dowels would be placed at different locations around the bands, gathering wind speed, reflectivity, and vorticity. While tornado pods were deployed by mobile mesonets to gather surface data, such as temperature, humidity, and wind speed. Millersville University also contributed with multiple data collecting instruments, such as a flux tower, radio son, sonar, and tethered balloon. One of the new, unique things uh, that Millersville does is bring a tethered balloon system. Uh, there aren't many places in the country that are doing tethered balloon measurements and what we were able to do is park a balloon at altitude so that we would be able to back out the momentum and the heat fluxes by measuring the gradients of temperature and wind speed and other parameters as a function of height. Well one's called a SODAR and a SODAR with RAS, that's what it's called and that allows us to get wind speed, wind direction, and temperature, and derive products in the lowest couple hundred meters of the atmosphere. The radioson, which is the instrument that, that is attached to the balloon, where the entire system, the, 
the radio sound and the balloon and the antenna, the GPS antenna that allow for the measurement of wind speed and direction, um, those instruments and the tether sounds are somewhat similar. The flux tower um, allowed us to calculate what are called surface fluxes. Um, in essence, that's how the ground talks to the atmosphere and vice versa. Over the upcoming years, researchers from universities associated with the project will analyze the data, which will then be put into computer models with the goal of ultimately better predicting lake effect snow. Reporting for WeatherWatch, I'm student meteorologist Austin Vasek. Thanks, Austin. That'll wrap up this episode of WeatherWatch. Please be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at the address is shown below. You can also visit our website, muweatherwatch.com, to view all of our previous episodes. For those of you at home, thanks for watching, and be sure to catch us next time.